Congratulations, Lorraine, you're pregnant. <laughs> Congratulations, you have just said to a woman who is pregnant or has had a new baby. <laughs> what an exciting time and happy event for her. Of course, complications can happen. Pregnancy and childbirth are not without risks. And not all women are happy and excited at this time. 20% of pregnant and new mothers will develop depression, anxiety, or another perinatal mood disorder. This video will help you identify, treat, and support these women. It is divided into four short chapters. Chapter 1, Presentation of Perinatal Mood Disorders. Chapter 2, Barriers to Identification and Diagnosis. Chapter 3, Screening and Assessment. Chapter 4, treatment, follow-up, and support. You can stop the video after each chapter to discuss the content and review the additional resources found in the guide accompanying this DVD. Before you start, please fill in the pre-test also contained in your DVD case. After you have watched the video, please fill in the post-test, place it in the envelope provided, and send it to the Best Start Resource Center or complete it online at www.lifewithnewbaby.ca slash training video. Right after the pregnancy, I felt very happy. Just the big happiness in the world, just right after he was born. Uh, a couple of weeks passed and I started feeling cranky and uh, very, very tired and my baby never slept more than two hours at night so after two weeks i was just cranky when months passed i i started feeling just very lonely anxious depressed and i felt oh my god like in a in a jail we were all happy to have another baby in the family but after the baby i started feeling sad and i was having headache and anything, I start to cry. And it was unusual for me, you know, to cry. I wasn't happy, you know, it was sad all the time. Oh, when Heather was pregnant with Joshua and uh, after he was born, she seemed very fatigued. Sometimes she just seemed very testy and uh, a little bit on edge. And uh, I felt bad every time we had an argument. So I, I would get so irritable all the time and get angry about the littlest, most trivial things. That made a lot of challenges in terms of our relationship. I didn't know what I was supposed to be feeling, but it wasn't what I had seen in the movies. It wasn't that instant love, that instant joy. It was just, it was emptiness. I didn't feel that connection I thought I would feel. When I went home, um, Dale had to go right back to work. I remember when he left, and I was home with this baby who was sleeping. And I thought, well, I'm supposed to sleep now. And I couldn't. I just couldn't. I was just, I felt so, so up, so tense that I couldn't even lie down. Um, I started doing housework, started walking around. He must have slept for five hours, and I didn't sit down once. I just couldn't. I was so anxious. It was a total anxious, anxiety-filled experience for me. I started realizing something was really wrong when I couldn't um, feel anything. There was there was no color at all in my life. Everything was gray. I just had no appetite. I didn't care about how I looked or felt. You know, I didn't care about having a shower. You know, none of that stuff mattered. Thoughts of harming the baby, um, from what I've read, are quite common in new moms. You know, just fleeting thoughts of oh, I can just see myself dropping him, or you know, maybe let him go in the tub and he might, you know, drown, or... Um, mine started out being that way, you know, and I, and I wasn't too concerned. It got to the point where I would be washing dishes uh, and washing, say, knives, and, you know, and looking at the knives and, and, and seeing things happening with the knives that um, would give me, give me nightmares now. I didn't act on anything. I didn't, and I knew deep inside I wouldn't. Other symptoms can also include worthlessness, hopelessness, and guilt. There are risk factors that make some women more likely to develop perinatal mood disorders, but it can happen to anyone, even when risk factors are not present. 
The strongest risk factors are a personal history of mood disorders, including a previous episode of perinatal mood disorders, a family history of mood disorders, a recent stressful life event, including recent immigration, and lack of social support. Moderate risk factors are maternal personality, low self-esteem, and relationship difficulties. Weak risk factors are low socioeconomic status, pregnancy, and obstetric complications. Women find it difficult to recognize and disclose their feelings. They face significant barriers. Nobody wants it. They felt the way I did. So I honestly felt that I was the only one. And I thought, <laughs> they're just going to call Children's Aid and take this baby right away from me. As a professional, I think that it's really difficult to ask for help when I needed help. I was too embarrassed, too ashamed. We uh, have an expectation of ourselves to, to be perfect and to, to always be functioning at our highest level. I couldn't look for help because I didn't speak much English. So I didn't feel comfortable picking up the phone to call. First of all, I didn't know where to call or whom to call. But even with a phone number, I couldn't get connected with someone. Mothers may also be afraid of what others may think. They may not have access to a primary care provider or may also be afraid of what treatment will involve. Often, they are not taken seriously. It is not only mothers who are afraid to bring up the issue. Care providers may feel the same. They may underestimate the problem. They may not know a lot about perinatal mood disorders and therefore not recognize the symptoms or ask the right questions or feel comfortable discussing it with the mother. They may also not know where to get support for the mother. Women may open up in different settings to share their symptoms with someone who is supportive and non-judgmental. When they do, it is important for care providers to validate their feelings, give hope and reassurance. Lorraine, I wanted to let you know that there is a group for parents close by. Have you ever been there with Marcus? Yeah, we've been there. Uh, I just don't feel very comfortable there. Everybody looks so happy and I don't really feel like I fit in too well. It sounds like you're having some problems with your mood. Uh, maybe we should check that out a little bit more. Um, I've got a tool here um, that will help us assess that. And um, when we score it, the numbers will tell us if we need to do some further assessment. Does that sound okay? Sure. We can use consistent tools to give all women the opportunity to talk about their feelings. The Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, EPDS, is a 10-question self-report screening tool. It has been translated into multiple languages and has been well validated. It can be used during pregnancy and postpartum. It's easy to score and helps clinicians know when further assessment is needed. All women should be screened during pregnancy and postpartum. Interactions with pregnant and new mothers can be enhanced with a few trigger questions to bring up issues of concern. This has been a very stressful pregnancy for you, Suzanne. How are you feeling? Well, I don't feel happy at all. I'm always worrying about whether the baby's going to be okay and whether the pregnancy is fine. I mean, what kind of mother feels this way all the time? Does that mean I'm going to be a bad mother? I feel like I've lost myself and I'm in this deep black hole. That must be terrible for you, Suzanne. You haven't mentioned these feelings before. How long have you been feeling like this? I've been feeling like this for a long time and it's getting worse and it's just getting worse and I cry but I don't let anyone see me cry and I just I don't know how to ask for help. No one's really asked me anyways how I feel. Maybe everybody asks me how I feel physically but no one asks me how I feel emotionally. I came in here today and I wasn't going to say anything to you but I'm so glad that you asked me how I was feeling because I think I need help. I do think I need help. With some symptoms of depression and anxiety, and the risk factor of pregnancy complications, Suzanne will need a full assessment. The next interview will show what is included in a full assessment. 
Hi Alison, thanks very much for coming in today. Uh, a lot of women have difficulty with their mood after they've had a baby. Can you tell me how you've been feeling? I know what I'm feeling isn't normal. I don't even know what normal is anymore. I thought I should be feeling really euphoric and, and happy and connected, but that just isn't happening. And I don't know what to do about that. Mm, that's really hard. Are there times when you can enjoy your baby? There are moments I find, especially when I'm nursing, it's very fleeting. It doesn't last long. And how about feeding? How's that been going for you? There are times when I'm breastfeeding that I feel very resentful towards him. And I know that it's not his fault and I shouldn't be feeling that way. First off, let's take all the shoulds and supposed tos out of the equation here because motherhood uh, is often really challenging. Some mothers feel that breastfeeding is the only thing they are doing right, while others find breastfeeding too stressful. Breastfeeding difficulties or failure can evoke feelings of inadequacy and guilt. It is important to support women and empower women to make the decision that is right for them in a non-judgmental atmosphere. Alison, can you tell me how your um, weight and appetite have been? I have no appetite right now. I haven't had any in a long time. Um, I've lost quite a bit of weight in the last few weeks. Uh, I hear how incredibly difficult this is for you. Uh, do you get out at all? Are you able to enjoy anything? Dale's always telling me to get out, get some exercise. But what's happening, the minute I leave the house, I'm finding I'm getting very short of breath. My heart's racing. I'm, I feel like I'm starting to lose control. I don't. I don't leave the house very often because of that. It sounds like your panic attacks um, are keeping you in the house. Like you're worried about a lot of things. Can you tell me about the things you're worried about? I worry all the time. I worry he's going to stop breathing. I worry about crib death. I worry what kind of mother I am. I know I shouldn't be worrying constantly. I can't relax. In addition to the worry, do you ever feel angry or irritable? I feel I get very angry. I know it's not his fault. He's too little to know what's going on. But every time he cries, every time he fusses, he won't sleep. I yell at him. I know that people tell me to snap out of it. It's just not something I can do. I can't control these feelings. Yeah, of course you can't change your mood. Nobody can snap out of uh, mood or, or depressed uh, thoughts. Uh, you mentioned sleep and that he's up an awful lot and I'm wondering how your sleep has been. You know, the state of exhaustion I'm in is indescribable. I've never felt this way before. What I find is that when he's sleeping, I'm concerned that he's not breathing or if he's, there's something's going to happen or I can't stop my mind enough to sleep. You've been telling me a lot about worry and that's something I hear an awful lot of. But in addition to that, many women have scary thoughts. Has that ever happened to you? I do get scary thoughts quite often. Um, some of the thoughts are really hard to talk about. In addition to thoughts, some women also have images, uh, actually like pictures jumping into their mind. Does it ever happen to you? Um, there are times I see myself doing things to him. Um, the, some of the really horrible things um, I find if I'm making dinner, I'll, if I'm handling a knife or a sharp object, I can, I can see myself hurting him. If I'm giving him a bath, let's say, I, I can see him going under the water. I feel horrible about it, but I don't, I can't stop it. I can't block them up. Yeah. I, I want you to know how glad I am that you're telling me this today. Um, these kind of thoughts and images are really common, uh, but they are terrifying and uh, really uh, hard to talk about. So you're thinking it, you're seeing it, but you're not doing it. I would it. never do it. What, what's stopping you? How do you stop I, yourself? I avoid situations. Um, I don't use the knives. They're at the back of the drawer. They're not easy to access. Um, I try not to give him a bath when Dale's not home, or I have Dale give him a bath. Do, do you feel like you're at risk of acting? I honestly don't think I could ever do it. Mm, glad to hear that. Alison, not only are these symptoms really common, but they're also fortunately treatable. And our job is to keep both you and your baby safe. I was really afraid. To, I've never told anybody what I've been thinking and feeling. Um, I'm afraid that when I leave here, 
when I get home, someone's gonna be there to take my baby away. That's, that's my biggest fear. I can honestly tell you that every woman who's ever told me about these thoughts and feelings has exactly that fear. Everyone is terrified of their babies being taken away, but that's not what our job is. Our job is to get you well and to keep both of you safe. And if we can do that uh, without separating you from the baby, that's the best thing. But we'll make that decision together. Thank you. Alison, can you tell me if you've ever had any thoughts of running away or escaping? I do sometimes think about running away or leaving. I figure that Tyler's so young, he'd never remember me. What you don't realize is that your baby really does need you. You've talked about running away or escaping. Have you ever had thoughts of death or thoughts of taking your own life? I've had thoughts of suicide. Um, it's gotten to that point at times. Though I think that me running away, he could blame me. If I were to kill myself, he would blame himself. And I couldn't do that to him. Allison, you talked about being angry and irritable a little bit earlier. Do you ever yell, hit, or throw things? Or do you ever harm yourself? I don't tend to throw things. I find um, harming myself is something um, I've had to deal with. And that's what's getting me very scared. Self-harm can be a way of coping with overwhelming emotion. You know, in the longer term, I, I hope to be able to teach you some things that will make you feel better and grounded and in control without having to harm yourself. You've talked about how down you have felt. Have you ever had the opposite of depression? Maybe feeling really high? Some people feel uh, extremely um, euphoric and happy or abnormally irritable with tons of energy and uh, little need for sleep. There are times when I find I'm suddenly not tired. I can do it all. Do you ever hear or see things that others might not hear or see? I don't know if it's the exhaustion, the not sleeping. Um, there's times when I've answered the phone and hadn't rang. And do you ever have worries that others are out to harm you? No, I've never felt that way. Oh, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Allison is not showing Don't signs of psychosis, mania, or bipolar disorder. These conditions would be treated differently than perinatal depression and anxiety. If you suspect psychosis, risk of self or infant harm, the client needs to have someone with her constantly until she has had an emergency psychiatric assessment. This can be a family member, a friend, a crisis intervention worker. If there is no one to care for the infant, a child protection agency may need to be involved. Also, every woman should be assessed for past psychiatric history, family psychiatric history, medical conditions, abuse, and substance abuse. With all the symptoms that you've been telling me about, it sounds to me like you're suffering with postpartum anxiety, with some symptoms of postpartum depression, um, which I want you to know is really common in um, pregnancy and postpartum. In fact, it's the most common uh, perinatal complication of all. You made it clear earlier that you didn't want to start with medications, and that's fine. There's many treatments that we have that don't involve medications. Um, but what we'll do is we'll follow you along uh, carefully. We can always change our minds. We find that our treatment isn't adequate and you and I will make that decision together. So what I would suggest for now is that you just focus on taking care of yourself and your baby. You need to get other people to come in and take care of household chores such as cleaning, cooking, helpers, uh, from the community, from your family, perhaps your husband. I've always found it really difficult to ask for help. It is okay to ask for help. It's a skill set that we need to learn. Would you like me to include your partner in this discussion? We might be able to help him understand what he can do to help you. I think Dale feels quite helpless and confused right now, so I think um, if somebody can maybe explain to him what I'm feeling without putting extra pressure on him. New moms always feel like they have to be the perfect moms. They feel like they have to do absolutely everything. But I want you to uh, put that aside for the moment. You will get there. You will be the mom you've always wanted to be. For now, entertaining is off limits until you're feeling better. Not to say that people can't come over, but they need to be supportive, non-judgmental, and they need to be helpful, hopefully bringing you a hot meal as well. 
Um, sleep is another issue. Getting enough sleep is going to be really important in your recovery. Uh, the first thing that I often recommend for um, moms is that they try one pumped breast milk feed that someone else can give to the baby so that you can get a longer stretch of uninterrupted sleep. That goes a long way to helping women feel better. Maybe Dale would be able to give your baby one uh, feed. Um, Dale's working an awful lot right now. And I don't want to ask too much of him. Another option that I often recommend to women is to have a sleep doula come in. That's not really something we can afford right now. Things are tight financially. But maybe my aunt, my Aunt Barb can come over and help. She's been quite supportive and that might be something we can try. It sounds like you've got some great backup. That's uh, really lucky, actually. In the short term, let's focus on getting you some help and improving your sleep. Then, when you can think a little more clearly, I would recommend for you some individual counseling or therapy. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can teach you in um, the course of therapy. One of them is um, relaxation. It's a fabulous technique that will help you to just go from up here all the way down, and that's going to help you sleep. Another is thought blocking. That's going to help you push away those really scary thoughts. And the third thing that we do in individual therapy that is so vitally important is talk about the adaptation to motherhood. It's a huge uh, shift to go from having no children to suddenly being a mother with all the responsibilities and the changes in your life that come with that. Well, you've told me that what I'm feeling is normal and that other mothers feel the same way. And I was kind of hoping maybe I could meet some other women who are feeling this or have gone through it. What you need to know is that there are support groups for moms who have postpartum depression and anxiety, and they are a huge help to moms. One thing for sure is every mom who comes through my door thinks she's the only one who's had these kind of difficulties. The other thing I want you to know is we will get through this together. I just want to feel normal. That's all. Well, we'll get you there. Okay. Thank you. You are going to feel better. Thank you. Mood or anxiety disorders are just as common during pregnancy as they are postpartum and often go unnoticed. But symptoms can cause much distress to the client and can have negative outcomes for both the mother and her unborn child. Practitioners are often cautious about the use of antidepressants during pregnancy. But while there may be small risks, there are also risks of not treating depression and anxiety. When mothers are on antidepressants, it is more common for babies to develop neonatal adaptation syndrome. In most situations, this adjustment is brief and requires only minor support for the baby. Taking an antidepressant during breastfeeding will have less effect on the baby. A risk-benefit analysis should be undertaken and discussed with the mother and her other health care providers. The possible medications should be researched for any new evidence and possible effects on the mother, the fetus or the infant. You can get information from the Mother Risk Helpline at www.motherrisk.org. Pregnant or new mothers require close follow-up to assess for the effectiveness of the treatment and side effects. Treatment may need to be adjusted or changed to achieve optimal well-being. Breastfeeding babies should be observed for breathing, feeding and sleeping difficulties. Both professional and peer support are vital for a woman's recovery. Diane, my public health nurse, she called me back and we had a long talk. Um, she was so kind, she was so reassuring. My, I think my husband helped me a lot. In, even though he would go to her, but he would call all the time to see how I was doing. My aunt, my Aunt Barb, who's my lifesaver, would come over, you know, two, three times a week. She, without asking, she'd do my dishes, clean my bathroom. I could tell her anything and she'd listen. She was such a support too. I think that it's everybody's responsibility, fathers, aunts, grandparents, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers. Everybody really has a role to play in this. 
Pregnancy or the postpartum period may not always be a happy time. For some women, depression or other mood disorders may recur. They will need careful screening and assessment during subsequent pregnancies and at other times of change. All women need to know that there is effective treatment and there is hope.